fourth not really independence day from the new york times july fourth nineteen o nine this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the new york times july fourth nineteen o nine fourth not really independence day July 2nd should have been Firecracker Day, according to John Adams, when freedom was won. Declaration wasn't signed on any particular day. Secretary's whim responsible for the 4th. This year, beyond all others, doubt is being cast upon the majesty of the Firecracker as the one and only method of properly celebrating the glorious 4th. This heresy is no longer confined to the ranks of the greybeards and nervous invalids, but has even reached the stage of popular comment. However, practically no one outside the ranks of the history professor doubts that, if one is to light a firecracker, July 4th is the correct occasion for that debatable operation. The general public, and particularly the gentlemen who have been denouncing the present-day university instruction, may be a trifle surprised to learn that while college students aren't taught that the Declaration of Independence is a meaningless bit of parchment, they are told that it was not signed on the 4th of July. In the grammar schools children are still shown the picture of the Patriot Fathers wearing their best velvet knee-breeches and most dignified expressions of countenance gathering around the table to sign, conscious that they were making history. John Hancock takes the pen, writes a smashing bold signature, and remarks that John Bull could read that without spectacles. For the college students, however, this is relegated into that portion of history as made by the poets, and they are told to go back to the sources. The story of how the Declaration of Independence wasn't signed on the 4th of July at all, as taught by unromantic college professors, is practically this. Before the winter of 1776, only a small proportion of the colonists wanted to separate from Great Britain. The New York delegates to the Continental Congress were forbidden, in their official instructions, to vote for any measure which might obstruct the restoration of friendly feelings. But during the winter of 76 the public opinion changed. The British fleet descended on the coast and burned Falmouth, Maine, and made similar attacks along the Virginia shore. Public indignation at these outrages expressed itself in the Virginia Assembly, when, on May 29th, Richard Henry Lee was instructed to introduce a resolution of independence in the Continental Congress at Philadelphia. Accordingly, on June 7th, Lee brought in the resolution that the United Colonies ought to be free and independent states. The motion was debated until June 10th when, as Jefferson noted, certain colonies were not yet matured for falling from the parent stem, but that they were fast advancing to that state. On June 11th, a committee of five was instructed to prepare a suitable wording for such a declaration. This committee was elected by ballot, Jefferson receiving the greatest number of votes, then John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Roger Sherman, and Robert Livingston. The writing was entrusted to Jefferson by the common consent of his fellow workers, for, as Adams records, Writings of his were remarkable for their peculiar felicity of expression. So Jefferson started in on his task. He had rented the second floor of a house at the corner of 7th and Market Streets, belonging to a bricklayer named Graff. Here Jefferson prepared the first draft. It was written on several sheets of legal paper, and is full of corrections, many made by the author himself, and a few verbal changes made by Adams and Franklin, as is shown by the handwriting. Jefferson then made a fair copy to present to Congress. The first draft he sent to Richard Henry Lee, 
who had been recalled to Virginia by the illness of his wife. This manuscript, with a note in the handwriting of Jefferson vouching for its authenticity, was handed down in the Lee family till 1825, when the owner presented it to the American Philosophical Society of Philadelphia. On July 1st, Congress adopted Lee's resolution that the colonies be free and independent states by a vote of nine colonies. South Carolina and Pennsylvania voted against it. The two delegates from Delaware disagreed, and their vote was divided and lost. The New York delegates expressed themselves as personally in favor of the measure, but were prevented from voting for it by their instructions forbidding them to obstruct reconciliation in any way. The committee then made its report. The meeting was adjourned, and the discussion postponed till the next day. But before the opening of Congress on the 2nd of July, the delegates from South Carolina and Pennsylvania announced themselves as having been converted, and a third delegate from Delaware arrived and changed the vote of that colony. So when the discussion opened, the passing of the measure was assured. In the debate that followed, various criticisms were made of Jefferson's wording, while the author sat, mute and writhing, under the threatened changing of his pet phrases. Adams was the colossus of that debate, Jefferson recorded. But even that hardy fight could not prevent the cutting out of a clause denouncing George the Third for protecting the slave trade and for hiring Scotch and foreign mercenaries. But the question of independence was practically decided. The next day, July 3rd, Adams wrote to his wife, Yesterday the greatest question was decided which ever was debated in America and a greater, perhaps, never was, nor will be, decided among men. And again, The second day of July, 1776, will be a most memorable epoch in the history of America. I am apt to believe that it will be celebrated by succeeding generations as the great anniversary festival. It ought to be commemorated as the day of deliverance by solemn acts of devotion to God Almighty. It ought to be solemnized with pomp and parade, with shows, games, sports, bells, bonfires, and illuminations from one end of this continent to the other, from this time forward forevermore. This letter of John Adams to his wife, the historians declare, proves conclusively that, as far as the actual separating from Great Britain was concerned, the Patriot Fathers themselves considered July 2nd the eventful day. It is the next step to discover how, then, the general public has pinned its faith to July 4th. The debate in Congress continued until the evening of July 4th, when, according to tradition, the Fathers marched up one by one and signed. The Journal of Congress, though, tells a different story. At the close of the debate, the secretary was entrusted to have a copy of the declaration engrossed, signed by the members, and entered in the journal. Anyone who has seen the ordinary facsimile copy of the declaration will recognize that the original from which it was made was this engrossed copy ordered by Congress, and not Jefferson's draft, in which his inherent and inalienable rights had been changed to the more simple inalienable. There is no disputing the fact that the signatures were added to the engrossed copy. This was left open for signature till into August, so the heroic picture of the daring Congress solemnly signing one by one after noble debate must be replaced by a vision of the secretary buttonholing the members wherever he could find them from July 4th into August and asking them to sign. When the document was completed, however, and was to be entered in the journals of Congress, the secretary entered it on July 4th, the date on which he had been instructed to have the declaration engrossed, and not on July 2nd, the day which Adams had predicted would be the great anniversary festival. That is why, 
so the iconoclastic history professors declare. The engrossed copy happens to read, In Congress, July 4, 1776, the unanimous declaration. Still worse, the declaration was not read in Philadelphia until July 8th, so there wasn't any first Fourth of July, with the boy in the poem calling to his grandsire in the belfry to ring for liberty. However, the historians will allow that it was read on July 8th, from the platform which David Rittenhouse had erected from which to watch the transit of Venus. Captain John Hopkins, commander of the first national ship of war, did the reading, and the crowds did cheer. Even the historians admit that much, only it wouldn't be July 4th at all, except that the Secretary of Congress happened to enter the document under that date. End of Fourth Not Really Independence Day From the New York Times, July 4th, 1909